All righty. Well, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I uh, hope you guys stay dry today, given, given the rain outside. It's going to continue for the whole day. So today's topic, now I have to say this before we begin, and that is there is a lot to get through today. You would have noticed this from the number of slides that you had to print out. There is a great deal to get through in today's lecture. We're actually covering two chapters and two topics. So just so you know, I'm not going to go through every single slide in a great amount of detail. There are some slides I'll focus on more so, hint, hint, but um, I just won't have time to go through every single thing purely because of time restrictions. So please make sure that you are reading your chapters. It's chapter two and chapter three, uh, just to make sure that you solidify your understanding of these topics. But as I said last week, the things that I focus on in the lecture, and you'll notice this as we go along, they are the key things I want you to focus on understanding, but particularly today, because there's two chapters, um, you just make, make sure that you read your textbooks to solidify your understanding. So the topics are legal environment, audit quality and ethics. So very, very, very important topics that we're covering today. So let's get started. Now on that front screen, on the first page of your slides, you will see two cases. Now essentially all I want to say about the case on the, the left hand side, okay, is it's about uh, the, the fact that ASIC has the power to suspend auditors from, for doing the wrong thing. Okay, so if auditors do the wrong thing, it is in uh, ASIC's power to then uh, start proceedings in order to get those auditors suspended. Now, when did that actually happen? The case on the right. Okay, the case on the right. Now, in this case, what happened was it was a PwC partner and he was banned from performing audits and signing audit reports for three years. Now, the facts of the case that led to this decision were the audit, first of all, the audit related to a company called Centro. Has anyone heard of Centro? They're in the business of shopping centres. So if you know Stocklands or Westfield, uh, they're in the same business. So if you actually, if you're from Seven Hills, you would know Centro because you have a Centro shopping centre there. Anyway, so it was the audit of Centro who was in the business of shopping centres. And what had happened that, what, so in that case, what had happened is that the company had uh, classified quite a significant amount of their liabilities as non-current. Now, as we all know, non-current means that they're payable and due in a period greater than uh, 12 months. But what happened with these particular sets of liabilities, what they, they actually weren't non-current. They were current. They were due within the next six months. Now, what's the value of the liabilities we're talking about in this case? $2.1 billion. So they had misclassified $2.1 billion worth of liabilities as non-current when they were actually current and due in the next six months. Now, where does the auditor come into it? So what happened with the auditor is that he knew. He knew about this and he still signed off on the audit report saying that things were true and fair. So when he was brought to court and all of this uh, kind of uh, unraveled, he turned around and his defence was that, okay, okay, I knew, but the way that I found out about this was not in an official meeting. So because it wasn't an official meeting, I didn't think that it was appropriate audit evidence. The courts in ASIC decided otherwise, essentially. So he had to um, have done something about it. It was not okay that he just signed the audit report. So he was banned for three years. So the case was in 2012. He's now able to, to practice again uh, in, from 2015 onwards. So that was an interesting case. And it highlights legal liability. Okay, legal liability. And before we go any further, I might just talk about... So you're going to notice that as I go through the slides, I have to pause between the slides so it doesn't cut off what I'm saying. My apologies. Okay, what I want to do is I want to add a page and I want to talk to you about legal liabilities. Okay, now before we go into this, I'm just going to go back. Okay, we're back. Now, no, oh my Lord. <laughs> oh, jeez. My apologies. Is Jimmy not working? Can you, can you let me know it's up, please? It's up? Jeez Louise. Okay. Apologies for that. I'm going to speed things up because we did just lose a little bit of time. Um, so again, just to recap, I will record the evening lecture as well, guys, and I'll see which one is better and I'll put it up. So I do apologise. Technology is great when it works. 
Um, so again, there are three avenues through which an auditor can be found legally liable. The first one is law and regulation. So if we breach a law or regulation, we can be found legally liable. Examples are, main one is the Corporations Act. The second one is e, uh, can be found legally liable through contract law. So there is a contract signed at the beginning of an audit. It is called an engagement letter between the auditor and the client. If we breach anything in that contract, the other party can sue. Third and final, probably the most important, is the tort of negligence, okay? And we're gonna be talking about that quite a lot. So on the screen, as you can see at the moment, auditing is a highly regulated profession. Highly regulated. So let me show you something. So we've got um, the ASX, okay? The ASX has actually uh, actual rules and listing rules, they're called, that organisations must comply with in order to become listed on the ASX, okay? We also have ASIC. Now, what I would like everyone to do is please put a link between ASIC and the Corporations Act. ASIC is the body that enforces the Corporations Act, everyone. So when we breach the Corporations Act, individuals do not sue us. It's ASIC that takes us to court, okay? Uh, so that was Corporations Act. There's APRA, there's the ACCC. Now, can everyone please cross out the Trade Practices Act and write the, uh, the Competition and Consumer Act 2010? That is what replaced the Trade Practices Act a few years ago. Okay, so please just make that correction. And again, it's generally the ACCC that takes us to court if we breach that. So that's the first one, the first avenue, the law and regulation. Now, there are three parts to that. We've got criminal law, consumer law, and corporations, uh, the Corporations Act. Under criminal law, under the Crimes Act 1914, this one's interesting. If in the course of the audit... The auditor finds out that their client committed a crime, ladies and gentlemen, we have to report it under the Crimes Act 1914. If we do not report it, then we can be deemed complicit under the Act. Okay? Now, this is interesting because who he watches the show Suits? Because it's awesome, you should watch it. Um, but with any legal show, you'll see one thing. There's a concept called privilege. And what privilege is, is uh, there's a privilege uh, relationship that exists between lawyers and their clients. So if the client tells the lawyer anything like, yeah, I did murder that guy, the lawyer doesn't have to tell anybody. There is privilege. It's confidential and it stays between them. The same concept applies between doctors and patients. Right? So what you tell your doctor stays between you and your doctor. They don't have to tell anybody else. That does not, I repeat, that does not apply in audits. Between an auditor and a client, privilege does not apply, which means that if we find out that the, audit, that the client sorry, did engage in criminal activity, we do need to report it, okay? Now, that doesn't happen very often, but let me just give you one example of when it did happen. Enron. In Enron, the auditors knew that management were not doing something correctly, and not only did they not report it, they actually destroyed evidence. So if you know the case, they started shredding the audit files and the audit documents when they found out the government officials were coming to check. So that's just one example of when it happened. Consumer law, as I said, the main legislation here is the Competition and Consumer Act 2010. Now the key concept under this legislation is misleading and deceptive conduct. Okay, so essentially we can be found legally liable if we as the auditor make a statement that is intentionally misleading or deceptive, okay? Intentionally, that's the key word. If you want, add that in there. Intentionally misleading and deceptive. And so someone relies on it, they suffer damages or, or losses, and we can be found legally liable for that. The last one is the Corporations Act. Now, I mentioned the Corporations Act last week briefly, and the key thing that I said there is that it's one of the main uh, legislations in Australia for, for businesses. It also provides guidance on how audits need to be conducted. So, for example, they set out that all company auditors must be registered with, do you know who? ASIC. Fantastic. All company auditors need to be registered with ASIC. Second one. ASIC monitors auditors, as do some other parties as well, okay? And that's set out in the Corporations Act. Independence, this one's probably one of the key terms. 
independence. We spoke about this quite a lot last week. We're going to talk about it again today. So the, the need for auditors to be independent is covered under the Corporations Act. In fact, there is a requirement that auditors actually sign what's called a Declaration of Independence and they include it in their audit report. So they actually sign and say, yes, I was indeed independent, there was no conflict of interest, and therefore I was able to exercise uh, objective judgment in getting to my conclusion. There's the audit partner rotation. So we spoke about those last week as well. I'm just going to change the colour. The rotation requirements. Let me see how much of this you remember. So out of every seven years, what's the maximum time an audit partner can stay audit partner? Excellent. Five years. Beautiful. That is listed out in the Corporations Act. Fantastic. It also talks about the auditing standards, which is the ASAs. My apologies. ASAs. The Corporations Act gives the ASAs force of law. They are enforceable under the, the Corporations Act. Reporting. The auditor must produce an audit report at the end of the audit. Let me ask you this. That makes it what type of service? It starts with an A. Who remembers if you have a written report at the end? Attestation. Attestation. That's exactly right. Good. Just... Remember that. Okay. And the final thing under the Corporations Act is there are things that limit the auditor's liability. First and foremost, uh, the Corporation Act says that audit firms can be companies. So believe it or not, the big four, they're companies. They are private companies, incorporate, private incorporated companies. So, sorry, private corporations. Um, in that regard, so when we say audit partner, it's not a partner in the technical sense of a partnership. They're actually companies. And the main reason for that is because they're of the advantage of legal liability. Sorry, limited liability, I should say. Okay? So I just wanted to mention that as well. Criminal liability, we mentioned already. Um, if we do find out that the client did something wrong, we do need to report it. That's all I really want to say about that. Now, I need everybody to highlight this term because this is the key. Okay, that we're going to be talking about. Reasonable, the concept of reasonable. It is expected that a reasonable degree of professional skill and care will be used by auditors in the performance of their duties. Okay, reasonable is the key term we're going to be discussing today. Now, I'll come back to that very, very shortly. In uh, audit, the audit partners are what we say, they're jointly liable. What does that mean? They're, they're liable for the actions of one another. Okay, now more importantly, they are liable for the work of their employees, of other firms they use to perform the audit, and the specialists or experts that they bring on to assist in the audit as well. So it's really important, and because they are liable for that, it's really important that we do reviews. Okay, review the work of our juniors, review the work of other firms that we have um, recruited to help us. Review the work of specialists and experts that we bring on the team to assist us with the audit. It's very, very important because we are liable for their work, okay? And as I said before, there is a lack of privileged communication. What we find in the course of the audit, if we find out that they did something wrong, we do need to report that, okay? There's no privilege. Auditor's liability to clients. Now, this one is important. If you go back to those three things that I told you at the beginning, three avenues through which we can be found legally liable, there was law and regulation, contract, and tort of negligence. Now, when it comes to clients, there are two avenues through which they can sue us. That's contract and the tort of negligence. Because if you remember what I said about the law and regulation one, ASIC takes care of the fact that we breach the Corporations Act. The ACCC takes care of the fact that we breach uh, the um, Consumer and Competition Act, Cons Competition and Consumer Act, okay? So when it comes to actual clients, which is the company that we are auditing, the main two avenues available to them is through contract, which is through any breaches of that engagement letter, which was the contract and formed that contractual relationship, and also the tort of negligence, okay? Now, I've mentioned the contract to you. Oops. I've mentioned the contract to you. That was the... Um, the engagement letter, but we haven't spoken about this yet, and that's what I want to focus on. This is really important. By the way, tort negligence all started with one case. Do you know what the case was? It involved a ginger bottle. Well done. Donahue and Stevenson. Okay, that's how it all started. There was a, uh, was it a snail or a slug? I think it was a snail. Yeah, within the ginger bottle. So that's how this whole uh, body of law began. 
Now, what I want everyone to do is write these next few things down. Okay. So I'm going to start a new page and I want to take you through the process. In order, now listen to me very carefully, okay? In order for an auditor to be found legally liable for damages under tort law, the plaintiff, the party that is suing the auditor, must establish the next five things in order. Okay, so listen to me very carefully here. The first thing that they must establish is that the auditor owed them, the auditor owed the plaintiff a duty of care. Okay, now that is pretty easy for clients to prove because there's an engagement letter that basically says that. That is different or harder, I should say, for third parties and we're going to go through that in just a minute. But they have to prove that the auditor owed the plaintiff, the person suing, a duty of care. Second, they have to then prove that the auditor breached that duty of care by acting negligently. That's the key word, okay, by acting negligently. What does that mean? Negligence, ladies and gentlemen, I was going to tell you this later, but I'm actually just going to mention it now. Negligence essentially comes down to they made a judgment or they made an error that a normal, keyword, reasonable auditor in the same position would not have made. Okay, so they made an incorrect judgment or they made an error or they missed something that was not reasonable for them to have missed. That another reasonable, normal auditor in the same position with the same information, they would not have made the same incorrect judgment or error. Okay, that's what negligence is. And that's why the key term that I'm going to keep on using today is uh, reasonable. Because the standard to which we, we uh, judge our auditors and their behaviour is we judge them against what is a reasonable auditor, a normal reasonable auditor in the same position, what would they have done with the same information. So we have to prove a duty of care. We then have to prove that they breached that duty of care by acting negligently. Third, it resulted in an incorrect audit report or an incorrect audit opinion. Okay. Number four. The plaintiff, the person suing, relied on that in oops, they, they relied on that information, and notice the wording I'm using, as a result, they suffered loss. Notice what I'm doing right now. They suffered not just loss, financial loss. You cannot sue for emotional distress. Okay? I was really upset that day. Please give me a million dollars, okay? It has to be financial, it has to be in dollar terms, okay? So they're the five steps. Now, the reason I wanted you to write these down is because you have to prove what's called causation, which means a causal relationship, step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. So one more time, you have to prove that the auditor owed the plaintiff a duty of care. They breached that duty of care by acting negligently. It resulted in an incorrect audit report or an opinion, uh, they relied on that opinion and they suffered financial loss. That's basically the sequence, the sequence of events that need to be proven. So coming back to clients, there is a, uh, a number of cases that you need to review. Now, for the purposes of this lecture, I don't have time to go through all of them, so I'm only going to touch on some of them, but please make sure you do read up on the cases that you see in the slides uh, in your own time. So the first one I'll talk about is very quickly about this one, London and General Bank. Now, that was the first case that basically noted the auditor had a duty of care. And what it specifically said was the duty of care is owed to the body of shareholders because they are the main users of the financial opinion and the financial report. Okay? Now, here's the key one. Kingston Cotton Mill. This is, probably a, this is a really important case. Let me just uh, bring your attention to something. The year that the case happens, 1896. This case is so, there's one particular quote in the, the judge's ruling in that case that we still talk about and you'll still find in every single audit textbook. And there was in 1896, okay? So two things came out of this case. Number one, the notion of reasonable, um, the whole reasonable thing, whereby, actually, you know what? Let me tell you what the quote was and then I'll link it through. The quote that came out of the Kingston Cotton Mill case was the auditor is a watchdog, not a bloodhound. Now think about that for a minute. The auditor is a watchdog, not a bloodhound. 
Two things. Number one, what came out of this case was that the judge ruled that auditors <clears throat> can only be expected to exercise, keyword, reasonable care and reasonable skill in the performance of the audit service, okay? They cannot be expected to guarantee that every single number is correct or every single transaction is correct. Why? Do we test everything, guys? No. What do we do? We take a sample. That's exactly right. So that came out of this case where we can only hold them to a reason, and that's why we provide reasonable assurance, by the way. Okay, so that came out in this case. Now, the second thing was in relation to fraud. And before I go into that, there's a concept I want you all to know, and I, I did mention this last week. It's called professional skepticism. Professional skepticism is essentially referred to as a questioning mind. What that means is, number one, we can't just take the client's word for it. We have to gain supporting evidence in terms of what they are telling us. That's the first thing I want you to know. Second thing is when it comes to fraud. Now, I'm just going to ask you this question and just be honest. This is not accessible. I just want to get the, the vibe of, of what the room thinks. Raise your hand if you think it is the auditor's responsibility to go actively looking for fraud. Raise your hand. Really? Responsibility to go actively looking for fraud. Auditor, fraud, what do you think? <laughs> So straight up, just let me see, just let me see. <laughs> hmm, people are hesitant, okay. No, it's not, okay? And that's actually a common misconception. So I'm sure some of you thought it, but just didn't put your hand up. Um, essentially, what I want to be very clear about is it is not, ladies and gentlemen, I repeat, it is not the auditor's responsibility to go actively looking for fraud, okay? It's not. We are a watchdog, not a bloodhound. We don't go actively looking for fraud, but... We must have a questioning mind. What does that mean? We have to be alert to what something that's called red flags. I should have done this in red. That's okay. Red flags. Indicators of things that don't look quite right. Indicators of suspicious activities. And once we see those, we must in investigate accordingly. Okay? That is what our responsibility is. It's not to go into the client and say, okay, let's find fraud, but it's about being mindful and aware of red flags. And when we see them, we have to investigate them accordingly. We are a watchdog, not a bloodhound, okay? The final one I'm just going to quickly mention is Pacific Acceptance. And with that one, uh, that's actually an extremely important case because a lot of what you now see in the auditing standards came from that case. I'll just name a couple of things. Number one, the fact that we have to make sure that the work of junior and inexperienced staff is reviewed came out of that case, okay? Another thing, the fact that we have to document everything that we do came out of that case, all right? So very important stuff. Um, so that's a, a lot of the, the results of that case have come through uh, in, in the ASAs. This one here, um, I'm not going to go into in too much detail. I just want you to have a read of it. But the key thing is we do need to report to management if we find what's called significant deficiencies in their systems and in their controls. So we're not just there to see if the numbers and the financials are true and fair, but we do get to understand the systems and the processes that the business uses in doing that. If we find a particular area that is really lacking, that's not really working for them, we must report that to management and say, hey guys, look, based on what we've done, we don't think that this is really working for you, so we advise you, here are some recommendations as to how to make it better. So we do include that as part, as part of our service, and in a way, it's kind of like to help the client see that we do add value. We do want them to, to better their business and the way it performs. So that's just something else that came up in this case. Um, and mind you, ASA 260 and 265, they are the standards that deal with communication, okay? What, how we need to communicate and, and what we need to communicate to the managers and to the boards of our clients. Contributory negligence, big one. Basically, what this one is saying, it's the idea of sharing negligence with somebody else, okay? It's situations when it's not just the auditor's fault, but also management or somebody else also did something wrong to contribute to the negligent act, to contribute to bringing about the loss, okay? Now, the, the case that they quote in this particular uh, section is AWA and Daniels, 
okay? And what happened in this case is that the auditor relied only on the verbal evidence from management. But management was lying, okay? So in that case, yes, the auditor was partly to blame because they didn't seek documentary evidence to support what the management was saying, but management was also partly at fault because they were trying to deceive the auditor. Now, on that note, yes? Yep, that's different. That's different. So if the records were destroyed in the first place, th by the way, that wouldn't be negligence unless they set it on fire themselves. Um, and that's dealt with what we talked about last week about inability to obtain audit evidence. Yeah, and we'll come back to that in a few weeks' time. Good point. Um, what I want to say here is just because information, or in this case the financial report, is being audited, you know what, let me step back. Who's responsible for preparing the financial report? Management. Do they have to make sure it's true and fair, yes or no? Yes. yes. If you didn't know this, write it down. Just because you're getting information, or in our case, a financial report audited, it does not relieve management and it does not relieve directors from their duty of making sure the information is true and fair in the first place. Okay? So just because you're getting an audited, it doesn't release them from that duty. And that's where contributory negligence essentially comes into play. Okay? So please be mindful of that. Now, third party. So we talked about the avenues available to uh, the client. Third parties are anybody else that's not the client. Ladies and gentlemen, a common misconception is people think that shareholders are the clients. No. The body of shareholders, the whole group, that's the client. Third parties will include individual shareholders. Individual shareholders, creditors, the bank, uh, suppliers, customers, anyone that is not in that contract between the auditor and the client, they are a third party. That includes individual investors. It includes future investors, okay, as well as the current existing shareholders on an individual perspective. So please be mindful of that. Now, we've gone through a, uh, let's say, a, a, an evolution when it comes to liability to third parties. So that's why there are a few cases that we're going to be touching on. First one being Canva. Now, what happened in this case is that the ruling came down to the fact that, let me just read this to you, the auditors are only liable to third parties who they know, emphasis on the word know, their clients will show the accounts to, okay? So what that means is if the auditor doesn't know that the client is going to show the financial report and the audit report to somebody, then they don't owe them a duty of care. Now, why is this continual term duty of care coming up? Because that was step one in the tort of negligence. In order for you to find, sorry, in order for the auditor to be found liable under the tort of negligence, those five steps must be established. Number one being, they owed me a duty of care. So you need to be able to prove duty of care to even be able to follow that avenue through. All right, so what was said in this case is that an adjusted case only owed, and again, sorry, let me be mindful, this is 1951. We're going through the evolution, all right? Um, in 1951, under this case, uh, they declared that adjusted case is owed if the auditor knows the client is going to show the accounts to somebody else. Fast forward, we go down a few years, and we get to a new concept, and I want you all to write this down. It's called reasonable foreseeability reasonable foreseeability. And even though there are a few cases here, which I would like you to read, I'm going to focus on Scott Group. What happened in, actually, let me step back and tell you what reasonable foreseeability is. Essentially, what was noted here is that if it was reasonably foreseeable for the auditor to know that, the, um, that this particular third party was going to rely on the audit report, then they owe them a duty of care. Now, let me give you an example to, to put it into perspective a little bit. In Scott Group, what happened was that this is the auditor, this is the client, and this is the third party, okay? Now, we have a contract between the auditor and the client, but in this particular case, the auditor knew that this third party was thinking of taking over the client's business, okay? They knew. As a result, the court ruled they owed them a duty of care. Why? Because it was reasonably foreseeable that this party would rely on the financial report and the audit report to make their decision about whether to take over this company. 
reasonable foreseeability. Let me give you another example. Let's break it down a little bit more. Uh, another example would be if a client comes to, that was terrible. If a client comes to an auditor and says, hey, I don't need to be audited, but I need to get a, bank, a loan from the bank. And the bank has said to me that I need to have audited financial reports in order for them to lend me money. So the reason why I'm asking you to perform this audit is because I want to get this loan. In that case, and under this particular rule, the auditor owes the bank a duty of care. Why? Because it is reasonably foreseeable, and the client has actually told them, reasonably foreseeable that the bank will rely on the financial report in order to make the decision about granting the company the loan. Does that make sense? Just head movement for me. Excellent. Reasonable foreseeability. Again, what's the year we're talking about now? We are talking about 1978. Evolution. Then we get to this one. Now, what I need everyone to do, highlight that word. This is now, we've reached now. This is the current rule. And the term is proximity. I'm going to speed things up just a little bit. This one's really important though. Actually, I'm going to take my time. What happened with reasonable proximity is, again, we're still talking about duty of care. All of these cases is literally talking about step one in the tort negligence five-step process. Proximity, so when it got to this point, essentially what they now say is an auditor only owes a duty of care to a third party when there is a relationship of proximity. Proximity means closeness, okay, closeness. Now, how do you establish a relationship of proximity? Write this, actually, you know what, you, you have this recording now, but you can write this down. It says, for a duty of care to exist, there must be circumstances establishing a relationship of proximity between the auditor and the third party. What does that mean? Here we go. The auditor must, excuse me, <clears throat> the auditor must encourage, write this down, encourage, entice, or induce the third party to rely on the report. One more time, they must encourage, entice, or induce the third party in some way to rely on the financial report, or the audit report, okay, on the audited financial report, let's say that. Now, I'm actually going to go to the next slide because this is actually the key case, okay, 1997, this is where we're at. The key case here, so remember what I just said, the auditor, it must be established that the auditor encouraged, indu uh, induced or in enticed the third party to rely on the report. So what was said here is that they must prove that the report was prepared on the basis that it would be communicated to that third party, it was likely to be relied upon by that third party, and the third party ran the risk of suffering loss if the report was negligently prepared. Okay, now this is the part that's interesting. Raise your hand if you've ever seen an audit report. Okay, does anyone know, who, who do we address in the audit report? Yeah, write that down. If you look at an audit report, you'll actually notice one thing. At the top, when it comes to who we are addressing, You'll, you'll either see it say members of the company, by the way, members means current shareholders, or it'll say shareholders. Why? Because if we are specifically addressing that group and only that group in our document, we are not encouraging, we are not enticing, and we are not inducing anybody else. As a result, proximity is not established with anybody else. Okay, why do we do that? We wanna limit the people we are exposed to and who we owe a duty of care. So specifically in that audit report, we set out to the members of the company. Okay, and by the way, it means existing. It doesn't even mean future investors. It means the existing shareholders of the company. And that's how we limit uh, the liability in that way. So unless it's specified, no relationship of proximity can be established. And if they can't establish proximity, there's no duty of care, and therefore they cannot go down that path. Okay? That's what I want you to know. So this comes back to those five-step process. Here we go. Number one, the plaintiff must prove that the auditor owed them a duty of care. Remember, that is easier for the client because there's a contract. It's much less easier for third parties. Number two, the auditor breached that, that uh, 
duty of care by acting negligently. Negligently, they did something that was not reasonable for them to have done. They, they passed an incorrect judgment or they made an error that another keyword, reasonable auditor in the same position with the same information would not have made. Three, resulted in an incorrect audit report. Four, the plaintiff relied on that incorrect audit report. And five, suffered what type of loss? Financial, okay? You cannot sue if you just feel not okay about it, all right? Now, there's one thing I just want to say about that term uh, reasonable when it comes to negligence. You might be thinking, okay, how do you know if it's reasonable? Let me just give you two, two examples, and I'll do this very quickly because I am running out of time. Um, very quickly. There's one example whereby um, say that the client engaged in an extremely complicated fraud involving senior members of the company. Like all the right people were involved to get this fraud underway, okay? Now, say it was a really, really big uh, case involving um, a quite material amount of fraud. If another reasonable auditor in the same position wouldn't have picked it up either because it was complicated and the right people were involved, then the, the auditor that didn't pick it up can't be found negligent because another reasonable auditor given the same access and the same information wouldn't have picked it up either. We hold them to that standard of reasonable. Let me give you another example. If an auditor was given information and they chose to ignore that information when another reasonable auditor in the same position would have actually actioned based off that information, then the original auditor was negligent. So the degree that we hold them to is that, that term, that reasonable term. What would another reasonable auditor in the same position, what would they have done? Okay? Um, and by the way, that's what the courts are there to decide. Okay? So it's not there for us to decide, but that's what the courts are there to decide. Hence all the cases. Now, there is one way that a third party can create and establish a relationship proximity, and that's through what's called a privity letter. Let me explain to you what this is. A privity letter is when a third party sends us, the auditors, a letter, and in that letter they say, hey, Mr. Auditor, I mean Mrs. Auditor, I mean just the auditor, because, you know, anyway. <laughs> um, can you please sign this letter and send it back to me, and by doing so, acknowledge that it's okay for me to rely on the report? Right? Now, by signing that letter and sending it back to the, the third party, we establish proximity. We have encouraged, enticed, or induced them to rely on the report. So here's my question to you. Do we sign this letter? No. no. <laughs> Literally, no. We look at it, we say, oh, that's nice, and then throw it out. Okay? Because we don't want to establish that relationship of proximity or duty of care to anyone unless we have to. All right, so that's one way they could do it very rarely. I've actually never seen one because they always get thrown out before they got to me. Disclaimers, we owe a duty of care to our clients. Hands down, that's locked in. You cannot what's called disclaim your liability to your clients. What does that mean? You cannot include a one-liner in your engagement letter that says, by signing this, you can never sue me. You can't disclaim away that liability. That liability is always locked in to the client, okay? Uh, this one goes back to say that uh, it actually says in the audit report that it's meant only to provide information to the shareholders. Okay, so it comes back to what I was saying before, that we only address it to the shareholders in order to limit uh, the liability to anybody else. Fraud and error, we mentioned this. It is not, I repeat, it is not the auditor's responsibility to go actively looking for fraud. But we must be a watchdog. We must be alert to red flags and investigate any instances that look a little bit suspicious. Okay? Now, what do I want you to make sure you note down this? ASA 240 is the auditing standard that deals with fraud. Now, in particular, oh, there we go. Auditor says the watchdog, not bloodhound. In particular, if you actually go to this uh, standard and you go to the back of that standard in the appendix, there is a big list of all examples of conditions and events that increase the risk of irregularities. What does that mean? It gives you a big list of what red flags would be. Okay? I encourage you all to have a look at that. It's, re it's pretty easy to follow. It's pretty easy to follow. And it gives you a good... And by the way, it's really logical. When you start reading it, you'll see what I mean. It's really logical in terms of, oh, yeah, that would be, that would be pretty suspicious. You'd want to look into that. Um, and that's an example of red flags. Again, we're a watchdog, not a bloodhound. But if things come to our attention, red flags, we must investigate them. 
managing legal liability, how do we reduce or uh, mitigate the risk that we will be found legally liable? First thing, and this one's interesting because you might not know this, so please do write it down. We deal only with clients possessing integrity. Now, let me explain this to you. We pick our clients just as much as they pick us. So when a client comes to an auditor and says, I want you to audit my financial report, we don't just look at them and say, okay. We actually investigate them. And we need to pick the client just as much as they need to pick us. So we investigate them. If there is a client, let me ask you this, if there is a company whose CEO or CFO has previously been charged with fraud, would we accept them? Probably not. Okay, we want to minimise the exposure that we have to legal liability and therefore we pick our clients. Here's another thing. If you have a client and they've been your client for five or six years, every single year you sign a new engagement letter, which means every single year you have to decide whether you want to keep them as a client. So this particular first line that we have is not just for new clients, it's for existing ones as well. There are rules and things that we um, engage in in order to pick our clients, okay, or accept our clients. We have to make sure that we employ qualified, sorry, we employ qualified personnel and make sure they are supervised correctly, okay, to make sure that they, that they perform the audit to a high standard. We maintain, uh, sorry, sorry, we follow the auditing standards. We perform quality audits. Quality control is huge, and we're going to be talking about that in just a minute. We need to make sure that we um, perform the audit to a high standard. We document everything, everything. Why? Because if someone turns around and says, hey, you were negligent, we say, here's our audit file, there you go. Okay? Now, what does that mean? That means that every judgment, every decision, every conclusion that we make, we must document. Because in the event that someone turns around and makes an allegation of negligence, we are able to support everything that we have done. The best support against a claim is to have evidence, okay? So we document everything that we do. And finally, just another one, um, we carry insurance just in case. And under the Corporations Act, actually, uh, there is a requirement for audit firms to have professional indemnity insurance, okay? Now we move on to the second half. So I'm just going to do the, the first bit. There are some slides I'm going to skip because you can read them. Um, I'm going to focus on the key things I want you to understand. Okay, corporate governance. Now there is a definition provided here. It is the term used to describe processes, structures and mechanisms that influence the control and direction of corporations. I'm just going to add one thing about that. Basically, what corporate governance, to me, what the way that my brain kind of works, is that it basically refers to the processes, the systems, the mechanisms, the procedures, the things that the business has in place that deals with decision making and the exercise of control. Now, what do I mean? In a business, in corporations, a lot of the time, you have what's called approval limits, right? So depending on what level you are, junior, manager, um, director level, you will have a certain amount of a, a particular number up until which you can approve purchases or claims or things like that. That's an example of corporate governance. It's things that we have in place for two main reasons, first of all, for accountability and transparency. Accountability and transparency. There are things that are in place to make sure that the business is working the way it is supposed to, okay? That they are carrying out processes the way they should. Key two things, accountability and transparency. And actually, I think that's on the next page. By the way, accountability and transparency, why do we need that? Why do we need corporate governance? Write this down. Agency problem or theory. All of these things that we have in place within organisations are there to deal with the agency problem. That's why they're there in order to promote uh, accountability, people are held accountable for their decisions and their behaviour, as well as um, transparency. So it's clear that they are doing what they are doing. And that's what it says on this slide. Now, I just want to talk about audit quality. Audit quality basically refers to the... Sorry. Audit quality basically refers to the extent to which an audit is likely to do two things. Now, listen very carefully here. I say that as if I don't want you to listen all the other times. Anyway, 
Order quality is the extent to which an order is likely to detect a material misstatement and report a material misstatement. Now, you might be thinking, why is that two different things? Because they are. Detection comes down to the auditor's ability to even pick up on the issue in the first place. So that comes down to skill and competence. Competence being a key word there. All right? They know what to look for and therefore can pick it up when they see it. That's different to reporting. Reporting deals with integrity and, most importantly, independence. You can pick up on something and not report it. So audit quality comes down to both of those elements. The ability to find the issue in the first place, but also the ability to report that. In Enron, they detected it, they didn't report it. So in order for have, to have a quality audit, both of those are required. Um, I'll just let you have a, look, a read of this. These are basically the corporate governance principles under the ASX. So companies listed on the ASX must comply with these. Here we go. This one's interesting because I actually mentioned this uh, briefly last week and I want to go into it in a little bit more detail now. Okay, really quickly. Number one, we talked about the audit expectations gap. If you go to last week's, I think it was the first slide I had up with all the different pictures. So what you think you do, what your mum thinks you do, uh, what your friends think you do and so on. Now what that basically showed us is there's different perspectives, right, of what audit is. Audit expectations gap. Pay very close attention here. Can you please close the door for me? Thank you. Audit expectations gap is the difference between what, notice what I'm doing, what society thinks the auditors do and what the auditors actually do. A lot of that gap comes, well, some of that gap comes from deficient performance or deficient standards, but a lot of it, in my opinion, comes down to misconceptions and unrealistic expectations that society has of auditors. So if you go to the next slide, these are some causes of the gap. Now, there's some things I want to mention. I'm not going to specifically re relate them to that. I just that there are some things that I wanted to bring up in this case. So it's caused by unrealistic expectations and misconceptions that people have. Number one, we've talked about this before. Many members of the public think that an audit provides absolute assurance. 100% guarantee that every single number and every single transaction was correct. Is that true? No. What's the highest level of assurance that we provide? Reasonable. Because we base it on sampling, we take a sample, we test it, we come up with a conclusion. Here's another one. We exercise a lot of judgment within an audit, and you're going to see this over the next few weeks. Audit judgment means that there are areas that are not black and white, there are grey areas. Okay, and as soon as you have that, that's an inherent limitation of the audit process. Okay, the fact that you exercise judgment. Another thing, and this one's interesting, stakeholders assume that if an auditor signs the audit report, it means management is doing a good job. No, it doesn't. All we're doing as part of an audit is objectively looking at the financial report and, and coming to a conclusion about whether we think it is indeed true and fair. We are not talking about what we think management is performing, if they're performing well or not performing well, okay? But that's a common misconception. They think that we're actually providing an opinion as to whether it's good, managing, um, good management of the company. Another one. Guys, what's the subject matter in a financial report audit? Information. What's the information? What's the key things that we're looking at? Two things. What's included in a financial report? Statements. Statements and notes. Good. Numbers, words, right? So we are looking at the financial statements and we are looking at the notes, the explanatory um, additional information provided to support the financials. Are we looking at the past information or are we looking at future information? Past information. Why am I telling you this? Because another misconception that there is, is that if we provide an unmodified audit report, is unmodified the good one or the bad one? Good. Unmodified audit report, the misconception is that that means we think the business is going to continue succeeding into the future. No, it doesn't. We are looking at past information. We are not looking at future information. We can't predict the future. One thing I want to say at this point is an audit cannot and does not, um, what's the word? Make up for, let's just say that. An audit cannot and does not make up for poor management. 
it doesn't make up for a poor business model and you can't expect auditors to predict the future. Best example, GFC, global financial crisis. A lot of the businesses that no longer exist post global financial crisis, they were getting unmodified audit reports because they reflect past information. They're talking about providing an opinion as to whether the financials are true and fair. We can't be expected to predict what's going to happen in the future. Okay, so there are all these things that lead to these misconceptions. Finally, when it comes to, to fraud, people think that's auditor's job to find fraud. Well, sometimes the auditor can't find fraud. Like I said, if you've got the right people in, and I'm not saying that the right people should get together and do it, but I'm just saying that if they did, they could get away with it. And it's not reasonable to expect the auditor to be able to pick that up. Okay. Competence, we've already talked about. Auditor competence comes down to their ability to have the skill, the experience, the expertise to do the audit, and here's the key, to detect material misstatements. Competence comes down to their ability to detect. Okay? So these are the, the, the um, elements of auditor competence. Just trying to think if I... Oh, no, that's all. Okay, quality control. As I said, quality control is incredibly important because we need to obtain high levels, high standards of control and quality because at the end of the day, we provide that legal document, okay? So we need to make sure that we uphold very high quality standards. Now, these are set out... This is... Okay, I'm going to tell you this one. Uh, I'll do it in blue. Okay. So, ASA 220, first of all, you need to know it, so make sure you have access to it. But what happens is under the Corporations Act, oh, is it the Corporations Act? Uh, hmm. I'll tell you, no, you know what, I'll bring this up a bit later because it makes more sense in a different space. I'll come back. But ASA 220, basically, um, an audit firm must have elements of quality control that relate to leadership, okay, that relate to making sure they meet ethical requirements so that their members, for example, are independent. The people that are on the audit team don't know anyone that works on the client. They don't own shares in the client. Things like that. Uh, we talked about this. There are rules relating to acceptance and continuance of client relationships. So whether we're going to take them on as a client or continue uh, providing them with audit services. We need to be very careful when it comes to assigning and allocating to people onto the audit team. Why? They need to have the skill. They need to have the knowledge to be able to do that particular audit. If someone is special, we talked about specialisation last week. If someone specialises in performing audits of, um, say, insurance companies, as the case was with me, then you can't expect me to be able to go on an audit of a mining company without having issues, okay? So you need to assign the right people to the job. We need to make sure that we monitor the results and the performance of that job. Key thing there, reviews. We talked about reviews last week. Reviews can happen within a firm, whereby partner checks partner work, or between firms. So uh, KPMG partner checking the work of a PwC. So very important, and again, all under ASA 220. Ethics, okay, so ethics are basically a set of moral principles or values that guide us in determining what is right and what is wrong, okay? Now, let me ask you a question. Do we all have the same set of ethics, yes or no? No, okay? It can be common for us to differ when it comes to some of our moral principles and some of our ethics, and a lot of that comes down to things like our upbringing, the environments that we've been in, the relationships that we've had, or the experiences that we have had. In saying that, ethical behaviour is really important for society to function in an orderly manner. And that's actually why a lot of the main uh, ethical principles and morals that we have are incorporated into our laws. For example, like, don't murder anyone, okay? Usually that's a common belief, uh, and that's incorporated into our laws. Now then, why do people act unethically? There are two main reasons. And I know that this is set up there, but I'm just going to explain them in a slightly different way. The first one... Uh, the person's ethical standards are different from those of society as a whole. What does that mean? They think it's okay. All right? That's basically what it means. So something that you might find unethical, somebody else might think, eh, that's absolutely okay. Best example, cheating on your tax. Okay? Or just being creative with your tax. Let's say that. All right? So I think it's okay. Another one that you could think about is... Um, <laughs> actually, no, but let's just stick that one. I'll, I'll give you an example later. 
The other one is the person chooses to act selfishly because of greed or power. Okay, so what that second one means is they know it's not correct, they know it's unethical, but they do it anyway. So they're two slightly different perception or perspectives, sorry, on um, on why people un act unethically. In both instances, reasons um, do exist. Have read of that. Now, what generally happens is this process called rationalization. What does that mean? By the way, this is going to come up again, I think it's next week or the week after, but rationalization refers to the attempt to justify the, the unethical behavior in the mind of the person perpetrating the act. So some common ways that people try to justify is, hey, 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 everyone does it. Everyone cheats on, I mean, is created with their tax return, so it's okay, all right? It's legal, so it's got to be ethical. Now, with that one, um, actually, come back to everybody does it because I have an example for you. Um, <laughs> so there was an article on this. So they found that, you know how we have self-checkouts at Coles and, and Woolies? Yeah. I think you'll know where I'm going with this, but um, you know how cherries are really expensive? Yeah. So there was this study that found that people, they were like, they were looking at their cherries like, why are the cherries, there's not many of them left, but our systems don't show that people are buying cherries. And it's not because they were eating them, they were putting them through as grapes. Right, because it's cheaper to buy grapes than it is with cherries. Now, again, that, the reason I bring that up is that's kind of this one. Oh, everybody does it. It's Woolies. They make a lot of money. They can afford it. Okay? So that's one way of justifying it to yourself. Another, if it's legal, it's ethical. Let me go back to accounting. Let me give you an exa accounting example. You should remember this from Accounting A and B. A really good example of why this is actually not the case is earnings management. If you had me as a tutor for accounting A or B, you would have heard me say this. Earnings management, the best way that I explain it, is it's essentially the legal manipulation of your financial information, right? It's legal because the choices and the options are there. The accounting standards say you can do it this way, this way, or this way. It's unethical because generally when you're picking a particular option because you want to show a particular number, that goes against the intention behind the, the choices being there in the first place. Accounting standards, they have choices because they want the accountant, the professional accountant that is ethical, to pick the one that suits the company the best. But earnings management is when they're not picking the one that suits the company, they're picking the one that suits the number they want to show at the end of the day. So in that case, even though it's legal because the options were there, it's not an ethical thing to do. And finally, the likelihood of discovery uh, and the consequence of being discovered is another key factor as well. If you don't think you're going to be found out, then it's, you kind of justify doing the act in the first place. If you're in a quiet street and you know there's no speed cameras, you're more likely to speed just like a little bit. Um, also, if, uh, if you're in a room... If I put you in a room and give you a test to do and I leave the room and there's no cameras, I mean, I'm sure everyone here would be super ethical in that case, uh, but you might be, the, the likelihood of something happening would go up slightly, okay? Now, if you ever are in an ethical dilemma, here are some things that you can follow. Um, the only thing I wanted to add here is both CA and CPA actually have a, an ethical hotline that you can call if you need advice. And this is interesting, so you might laugh at that. That's legit and people do call because once you guys start working, you'll see, okay? You'll see that sometimes you just need guidance as to how to deal with certain situations. I actually have a, a student that I will not name who is having um, an ethical dilemma at her role at the moment. So, yeah, there is a hotline you can call. <laughs> All right, ethical contact in professions. Now, that is our focus, okay? So um, professionals, as it says, are expected to conduct themselves at a higher level than most other members of society. Why is that? Because we need people to have confidence in us. We need the public to have confidence in the quality of the service that we are providing. Now, a lot of that, we talked about this last week. Actually, let me see if you remember. The quality of audit, the value of audit comes down to two things. Independence, and do you remember the second word? Expertise. expertise, that's absolutely right, okay? And expertise and independence collectively when it comes to the value of audit is also hand in hand with quality. So we need to make sure that we are ethical in what we do so the work that we provide is seen to be valuable. They can rely on what we, the final conclusion um, is. Just really quickly, really, really, really quickly. No, 
actually, we're just going to keep going. It wasn't that important. I just wanted to add more to it. Okay, what do you need to know? Ethics is so incredibly important that we have a standard dedicated to it. Now, it's not an auditing standard. I want everyone to write this down. It is called APES 110. Write that down. Ladies and gentlemen, I need every single one of you to download that document during the week because you will need it. Okay, APES 110, it is called the Code of Ethics for Professional Accountants. Notice I said professional accountants and not auditors because it covers all professional accountants. I'm talking financial accountants, management accountants, tax accountants, auditors. Okay, so you need to have access to that. Now, that is the official code, uh, code of ethics that we have and we must comply with at all times. One of the most important things I need you to know are these. These are what we call the fundamental principles for professional accountants. There are five. We must make sure that we comply with all of it. Now, I'm going to go through these with you in just a moment because I have them on another slide, but I just wanted to highlight APES 110 for you. And by the way, it's right here. It's commonly, by the way, it's just commonly referred to as the code. Okay? Now, if we breach that code, it can result in fines, suspension, and forfeiture of membership. All right, that's all I really wanted you to know there. There are three parts. We will focus on part A, oops, part A and part B. Okay? Here we go. Now, I need everyone to pay really close attention, particularly for the next three slides, okay? Uh, I'll be quick. So, let's go through them. These are the five fundamental principles for professional accountants. Under APES 110, every single professional accountant must comply with these, okay? Now, you may have seen this already. I think we teach it in Accounting B, so you would have already seen some of these, but that's okay. You really need to know it, and I'm going to talk about it more so in the context of audit, okay? Here we go. First one, the need, uh, the, sorry, the fundamental principle of integrity, what does that mean? It refers to the need to be straightforward and honest. Essentially, don't tell lies. That is the principle of integrity. We must act with integrity in all communications with our clients. Or just all communications full stop. Okay? Next one. So that was integrity. Next one, objectivity. First of all, if you can, next, so just write independence. Because to be independent is to be objective. They're very closely aligned. They are Pretty much the same thing, right? Now, what objectivity refers to is the fact that we must not allow bias or prejudice impact on our judgment. We have to avoid all conflict of interest situations so it doesn't impact on our decision making. We must be independent. Remember what I said about independence. It's not being related to, associated with, or influenced by the information, the people who prepare it, um, or how it was prepared. All right? That's objectivity. So very closely linked to independence. Professional competence and due care. We not only have to attain the skills, the experience, and the knowledge to do the job, we have to make sure those skills and experience are updated throughout our careers. Let me just give you an example. CA and CPA, in order for you to become a CA or a CPA, you must uh, complete some postgraduate qualification studies. You also need professional experience. So if you just do your studies and you don't have professional experience, you're not going to get into membership until you do. Now, that's not enough. Oh, sorry, that's not it. Once you become... So I'm a CPA. So once I became a CPA, I couldn't relax <laughs> because with both of them, CPA and CA, they have what's called CPD hours. CPD hours are called continuing professional development hours. Now, I'll tell you what it is for me. So for, as a CPA, in order for me to maintain my status as a CPA, I must engage in a minimum of 120 hours of continuing professional development every three years. If I don't, then I will lose my status as a CPA. And on that note, that's audited. So there's a, a book that we have to maintain and it is audited, so we have to make sure that we do it. So it comes back, why is that there? Why is that requirement there? Because of this. It's there because we need, there is a fundamental principle, principle for professional competence and due care, having the skills and keeping those skills updated to make sure that you can do the audit. By the way, this also links to the fact that if you don't have the skills to do, perform a service, you shouldn't be performing the service. So if you specialise in insurance and not in mining and you don't know anything about mining companies, you can't be put on a mining company audit unless you get the skills or there's someone to help you understand what to do. 
okay? Confidentiality. Confidentiality comes down to the fact that we must keep the information that we get access to throughout the audit to ourselves. In our context, financial report audit, the information of the financial statements and the notes of the financial statements. Now, let me ask you this. Is that information publicly available, yes or no? While we're doing the audit, is it publicly available, yes or no? No. No. Okay. So because it's not publicly available, we must keep that information to ourselves. It is confidential. We cannot disclose it to anybody, nor can we use it for our own personal gain. So, for example, I can't use that information to go and buy and sell shares on the ASX, nor can I tell my my friend to do that. Now, this notion of confidentiality also extends to trade secrets. So, if I was on the audit of KFC and I found out what the secret herbs and spices were, I've got to keep that to myself, okay? If I was on the the audit of Coca-Cola and I found out the recipe for Coca-Cola, I would probably stop drinking Coca-Cola. Um, But I had to keep that to myself as well. Okay, confidentiality. Do not use the information or disclose it to others for the purposes of of gain. Professional behaviour. Can everyone please write this word next to it? Reputation. Professional behaviour, as the term suggests, is we must behave professionally. Okay? Now, we need to uphold the rules, the regulations, and overall the reputation of the profession. What do I mean? Reputation is key because it's actually the reputation of an audit firm that's its greatest asset. Clients pick an auditor based on its name, its brand, its reputation. So maintaining a good reputation is absolutely critical. Even allegations can taint it. So you've got to be really careful. Now on that note, reputation is linked to image. Now can you raise your hand? Has anyone ever seen an auditor? Just raise your hand for me. It's like a mysterious creature. Okay, what were they wearing? What were they wearing? A a suit? Okay. (laughs) So there's a reason for that. If you actually uh, have seen auditors, you'll notice that they dress quite conservatively. Now, why do you think that is? Because they're boring? Is that what you said? (laughs) That's often the response I get. There's always at least one person that says, because they're boring. Dressing conservatively by auditors, some some of them are boring, I'm not even going to deny that, but it's actually a marketing ploy because you're more likely to trust someone in a suit and tie when it comes to the profession of auditing than someone that comes to the audit in a t-shirt, shorts and thongs, right? It portrays this image of trustworthiness and professionalism, okay? So that's, um, that's what we're talking about here, reputation, all right? So we have to maintain all, so we have to uphold all five fundamental principles. Uh, Let's go to the next one. All right, now, what I would like everyone to do up top here is it says here threats to fundamental principles. Can you please write threats to independence? Independence. These are actually the threats to independence. Now, these, again, super duper important, okay? Incredibly important, so let's go through them. We'll do it one by one. Self-interest is, in one word, greed. Okay, it's greed. Self-interest refers to when the, the, the auditor's personal desire for money overrides the public good. Okay, that's basically what it means. Now, I want you to add two words. Financial interest, write that down. Financial interest. Because self-interest examples often include some form of financial interest. An example of that is when the auditor owns shares in the company they are auditing. Let me ask you a question. If an auditor owns shares in the company they are auditing, what are they? There are what? Members. They're a member. They're a shareholder. Okay? Now, as a shareholder, what would they want the audit report to be? Unmodified or modified? So could, can that person who is a shareholder of the company and is the auditor of that company, can that person be independent, yes or no? Hence why this is a threat to independence, okay? So any situation where there is a fi- oh, it says financial interest, <laughs> any situation where there's a financial interest between the auditor and the company they are auditing, there is a self-interest threat. And that 
threatens the most important thing in audit being independence. So we need to make sure that it is avoided um, at all costs. Okay. Self-review. So we just talked about self-interest. Oops. Self-review. Kind of self-explanatory. It's when you review yourself. Okay. So it's a situation where someone is checking or auditing their own work. A really good example of that, I mentioned to you all last week, that we not only provide audit services, we also provide non-audit services, such as bookkeeping, tax returns, things like that. So if an auditor was involved in helping the client prepare the financial statements, can they then turn around and audit those same financial statements? Yes or no? Yes or no? Yes or no? No. Okay, <laughs> okay? that's self-review. Let me give you a, an example closer to your heart. Uh, if I gave you all an essay to do right now. So I gave you an essay question and I wanted you to write one page worth of an answer to that question. I gave you 10 minutes. At the end of the 10 minutes, I said, okay, check your own essay, mark your own essay. And you look at your piece of paper and you think, this is the best essay I have ever seen in my entire, I am a genius. HD, that's self-review, okay? You're not exactly objective when it comes to checking your own work. Often people will just say, you know what, a high distinction isn't enough. 110 out of 100, okay? You're not exactly objective. Now, on the other hand, if you, if you don't have very good self-esteem, you're like, it's a fail, this is terrible, Jesus Christ. Either way, it, you're not independent, <laughs> okay? So we can't trust what comes out of it. Have a good day. Next one. Advocacy. Now, this one's interesting, and this links to something I'm going to say. Okay, I'm going to speed things up. Advocacy means you cannot, one more time, you cannot promote the client in the eyes of others. Write that down. Cannot promote the client in the eyes of others. Example, I cannot go to my friend. So if I'm the auditor for Coca-Cola, I can't go to my friend and say, hey, Coca-Cola is a really great company. You should buy shares in it. You cannot promote the client to other people. Another example is if the client needs a loan from the bank, you as the auditor cannot go to the bank and say, no, 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 they're really great, you should give them money. That's advocacy threat. And you're going to see why that's the case in just a minute because I'm going to tell you something else uh, in the next couple of slides. So you cannot promote the client in the eyes of others. Familiarity, look at the beginning of the word, familiar. Familiarity refers to the fact that if there, oh, let me, let me rephrase, it occurs, familiarity threat occurs when there is a close relationship that either already exists or develops between the auditor and the client, okay? Now, why is that an issue? Because the longer you know someone and the longer you work with them, the more likely it is that you'll overlook something. Let me give you an example. Um, say I'm the audit partner of Tia is Awesome audit firm and... No? Okay. <laughs> um, and I am, so I've been the audit partner for a few years on this client, and I become really good friends with the CFO. And the CFO's name is, I don't know, Diego, right? And so me and Diego, we're, we're good friends. We go out to coffee, we have lunch. And one day we, we go out to lunch, and he's, you know, he's really down. I was like, what's up, Diego? Like, what's going on? And he says, look, Tia, I'm just, I'm having issues with my wife. And I go, oh, it's sad. <laughs> there, there, kind of thing. And he's like, yeah, like, it, you know, it's terrible. So I go back to my audit uh, team and one of my managers comes up to me and says, Tia, we just found a fraud of $2 million. And I turn to, let's say, Sophie. I say, Sophie, Diego is going through a really tough time at the moment. He's having issues with his wife, right? Let's just discuss this later. Let's just, let's just move on. Now that is a, I, that story sounded better in my head, obviously, but um, <laughs> that is an example of familiarity threat. When you become too close, you lose objectivity because you become sensitive to the, to the needs of the client, okay? And that, by the way, here's your link. That is why we have audit partner rotations, okay? So that doesn't happen. So the whole Tiago, Tia, Tiago, oh, we could have a couple names. <laughs> so Tiago doesn't happen. <laughs> oh, okay. I love what I do. Okay. Intimidation threat. I'll be very clear because this is the last one. Intimidation threat is basically when a member, so that when the auditor um, feels threatened, okay? It's when the auditor feels threatened and they're unable to act objectively because they fear negative circumstances or, or negative consequences. Best example, when the client uh, threatens to fire the auditor. 
That's intimidation threat, okay? Because we feel threatened, we're unable to act objectively because we fear the negative consequence, which in this case would be getting fired. So these are really, really important because they threaten the most important um, concept in audit, which is independence. So what do we do? We have safeguards. Ladies and gentlemen, a safeguard is anything that is put in place to deal with a threat. Write that down. It's anything that we put in place to deal with a threat. The need for audit partner rotations under the Corporations Act is a safeguard. The need to have different people conduct uh, non-audit services and audit services, that's a safeguard, having that separation of that group. Um, what else is there? Signing the Declaration of Independence, that's a safeguard. Making sure that people, oh, let me give you just one more example. One of my friends, oh, be really quick, this is a good one. Um, in KPMG, so we, he, this was, I won't tell you what the client was, but um, there was one client, one company who everyone knew was just not good to audit, like just not the, not the greatest audit in the world. Um, it was really long hours, it was intense. And so one of my friends heard that he was going to be put on that client, <laughs> So he went and bought shares in the company. And so when it, and they came to him and they said, oh, like, you're going you're gonna to be on this client. He's like, I'm sorry, I've got shares. <laughs> Self-interest, like, you know, I'd love to help, but I can't. <laughs> All right, so what happens in uh, the big four as well is they send you around this massive Excel spreadsheet and they ask you where you have your shares. And that is to prevent someone that's a shareholder being put on the clients. <laughs> so clever, if you ask me. All right, you need to have access to these. The main one will be 290, section 290. Independence, okay, key thing here is this slide, and again, I've got like literally one minute that I'll do this. Um, ladies and gentlemen, in order for you to be classed as being independent as an auditor, you need two things. Listen very carefully. You need what's called independence of mind. You need a state of mind where you can actually exercise objective and independent thought. So not be biased, not be influenced by anyone. Hold on, that's not enough. You not only need to have state of mind that is independent, ladies and gentlemen, you need to have appearance, you need to look it. Go back to that advocacy threat. Even though if I'm telling my, my friend, hey, you should buy shares in Coca-Cola because they're really good, I can still be independent in my mind. I can still be um, objective when I perform an audit. But do I look independent? No. You need to have both aspects in order to be independent as an auditor. Independence of mind as well as you need to look. Uh, these are some examples. And just have a read of that. And you are done. You've done so well, guys. Well done. And uh, have a great day. I'll see you next week. All right, before everyone leaves, I'd just like to make an announcement. So I'm a member.